The film was Christopher Nolan's magnum opus and a stunning technical achievement. What was his brief to you in creating the distinct period setting of the film? His, his brief from the beginning was uh, entirely in camera. Um, he wanted to capture and build everything in the real. He wanted huge scale, huge scope. Um, but huge doesn't, didn't mean expensive. It, it, it just, it, it was about being smart. It was about thinking cinematically, thinking, th you know, thinking grandly and knowing that we would be shooting entirely on 65 and IMAX and with the worlds, uh, Los Alamos, Trinity, all of that, he, from the get-go wanted 100% ground up, no green screen, no blue screen, no set extensions, no stages. We would be in the middle of nowhere. We'd be out in the wild. We'd need to hit the road and find our locations. And once we find our locations, we design our worlds and literally from the earth, just sort of build them up. And I think it was just incredibly exciting, invigorating. The script, the very first thing I did was read the 180 page script written in the first person never read a script in the first person before. Um, I didn't know, I, I don't think he'd ever written a script in the first person. And, but immediately it takes you right into the point of view that he wants you to, it's an Oppenheimer through the eyes of Oppenheimer through like, we are seeing the world as Oppenheimer, which was, so the world I'm designing is through the eyes of Oppenheimer and um, his world. And I think um, a lot of our early conversations, Chris and I spent eight weeks together, just he and I, approximately eight weeks, give or take, talking about what we wanted this film to look like, um, what the production design was to be. I mean, it obviously American Prometheus was seven, 800 pages long. They did, those authors, 25 years of research. So we had mounds of research to start from in addition to our own research. I mean, so so much of this is captured photographically and through manuscripts. We got our hands on all of it. We had an incredible researcher, Lauren Sandoval, who was able to work with universities and archivists and libraries and the US government and pull all of the declassified information. We had how to build the bomb from the ground up, all of it. And we just um, dove I ended up covering a house. It was our production house where the art department was based. Floor to ceiling in imagery. Every single room in the house, when you would weave through the hallways and into this room and into this room and into this room, I did it categorically dealing with all the different time periods. So as everyone was coming through to read the script, actors, um, crew people, they would read the script and then Chris would make them just weave and spend an hour, two hours just soaking up the imagery because you could read the script and immediately see it before your eyes. Um, and this wasn't any of our designs yet. This was just the research, but Chris was very clear. He said, Ruth, I, I am not making a documentary. We are making our own film. We are not copying this imagery. We take this imagery, we divorce ourselves, and and we make our Oppenheimer, which you know is what you see on screen ultimately. And so we had we took creative liberty, um, but obviously with the town of Los Alamos, it was massive, 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 massive. I mean, the U.S. government had two gave Oppenheimer and his team two billion dollars in 1942, not the equivalent, but actual $2 billion, $2 billion in 1942 is like, uh, you know, 30 billion at this day and age and plus the entire army corps of engineers so that he had so much support. And um, I, I didn't, I had great support. <laughs> I didn't have that kind of means, but we had to think very smartly and very strategically. And we did that. And we uh, designed as we were designing our town, laying it out. We just started from the gut. It was very instinctual to Chris and I. I had just come off of Nope um, and I built an entire Western town 360 from the ground up. Very stylized, totally different genre. Um, but so I had, having just done that, I had so much momentum of, okay, no problem. Let's erect a town. You know, it, it was um, just three times the size of our little Nope back lot and which I thought, so it was, um, I think 
it was a constant collaboration from day one all the way through with Chris. I mean, he is such a magnificent director and leader and visionary. And it it was so inspiring every day to show up and with Hoyta collaborate and Chris and myself and just be in it, figuring out, okay, how much of this can we afford? I had my initial design of this town, which was huge. And I did it in quarter scale white models. And I put it on like a huge table that actually only fit in the backyard. And when we put a budget to it, it was, it exceeded what we could afford. So we just started plucking buildings off of it going, okay, I think this can work. And he and Hoyta would talk about how they wanted to shoot it. At the end of the day, they shot Los Alamos 360, every inch, every building, every side. And I remember leaving and just going, do you guys feel like you, it was enough? And they said, literally, it couldn't have been any more, any more would have been excessive and any less wouldn't have been enough. And it was and I, you know, I, I think it was impactful. It provided just enough backdrop, all practically, which is what we were dedicated to doing the entire film. And it was so great because we, doing it practically allowed us to embrace whatever weather was happening, snow, rain, wind, overcast. And, and, and that shaped our story so beautifully when we were shooting down in Los Alamos we got hit with a massive windstorm when Killian is climbing our hundred foot tower and it's like, you know, he's like, are you sure this is safe? And Chris is like, yes, <laughs> he would never put us in any real danger, but it, and Chris loved it because it brought so much to the story that you couldn't, even through special effects or, you know, doing it in a sound stage, you don't, you not, you aren't, it gave the actors so much to be on location surrounded 360 by exactly what by a period set I mean up at Los Alamos Chris and I didn't allow any tents no contemporary cars nobody's vehicles we moved base camp way down like a mile down the road we just didn't want to see any modernity and we wanted everybody to be transported they could come up in a van be dropped off and they were in the world of Los Alamos and Oppenheimer and so that's that's that, that was our approach the the whole film was to create his world and and truly sink into it and live in it and be in it early on in the film while can you hear the music plays the sequence jumps from cathedrals in europe to close-ups of oppenheimer to him observing the cubist painting woman sitting with crossed arms by picasso and reading the wasteland by t.s Eliot. It would come to reflect a new world order moving away from the classical to the modern industrial. What role would you say the production design had in bringing this sequence to life? Curating all of the locations every uh, everywhere we shot with Chris and, and thinking about his journey during that time and where he was in the world. And um, I think, it, it, I mean, and they were very simple. They, they you know, we didn't overcomplicate them, but it, it, what Chris, I mean, the little props like him reading waste, reading wasteland, just the was what told you so much, right? You didn't, you didn't need this elaborate set. It was just very. So that was how we treated that um, sequence, which we obviously shot all over the place at very different times. But then the montage was put together in editing. But um, so I think it was just being extremely specific with with the locations we chose and even in Europe and um, what what we wanted to feature, um, which buildings, which universities, why, his journey, where he was, what, you know, all of that was an important part of his early story and then getting to Berkeley. And then, so a lot of, I guess, pre, prelude up to, you know, him being offered um, the position of running the Manhattan Project. Would you say your sets were somehow catering to capture the deep emotional states of the characters, especially the angst and conflict of Robert Oppenheimer? It, it, it's an interesting thing because the worlds we were building were places that existed outside of Oppenheimer, but then Oppenheimer inhabited those spaces, right? So we were careful not to be too contrived or as Chris liked to use the word precious. He did not want to be precious um, with, a, with with any of this, he wanted it, from the costumes 
to the wardrobe, to the makeup. He wanted everything extremely authentic and natural, grounded, real. And our main goal was to be extremely transportative or transportive so that the audience, we, we take them right to that place with Oppenheimer. We weren't pushing the spaces in any way emotionally. It was more, this was the actual space. This was the Christmas party or this was his house. And, and that's what Oppenheimer brought to the film, Killian, was the, that emotional level in that space. But I think what we did to really support him in that and all of the actors is um, we took them to a lot of the actual places. So I took in Los Alamos, instead of building the interior of his house at our location, I took him them. We went up to Los Alamos, the actual Los Alamos, that plateau, and went to his period house that is was sitting empty and is now going to be a museum. And we shot in that house. And I remember that morning, Chris, Killian, Emily, the responsibility they felt of doing those scenes in the real house, in the real walls. I mean, it was the same restroom, you know, it was the same everything that Oppenheimer inhabited. And I think that was extremely overwhelming for them, but in the best, it informed their performances. That's how I understand it. Less so me designing the and putting emotion into my sets, it's more my set set the stage for then Oppenheimer to bring that emotion alive. The film's built character, especially in Los Alamos, was distinctly American in the sense of building anew in the desert and a transient Western-like setting in which these buildings are placed. Did you have references you drew from in creating these? Very much. We had a lot of reference that we worked off of. Um, it, it, all the materials that they used during that time uh, in, in during World War II and sort of these government styled buildings that existed throughout America. Um, and I, we, we leaned heavily into those. And Los Alamos was a, where they went in Los Alamos, there was this boys school that they commandeered and that was the huge lodge. And so a lot of the buildings that you see that were also log cabins along Main Street, that informed us um, just the direction to go, that it was a mix. It was a mix of these newly formed buildings that went up um, and then the log cabins, which a lot of the professors or teachers lived in those. But when Oppenheimer came up and took over, he took over the lodge and all the cabins and then those became uh, distinct offices and, and, and various things. I mean, his whole plan in convincing scientists physicists, you name it, everybody he needed to come to Los Alamos was, I am going to build this. And I know it's the middle of nowhere. It needs to be in the middle of nowhere. It needs to be in secret, but I'm going to create a community. There's going to be a hospital, church, school, beauty parlor, everything, bar, his office, you know, everything that to, to, to make it easier for uh, the families to come and want to come. So it was important that we, to your point, the urban planning was was very thought through. And, um, you know, we, when you look at the real research, I mean, it's it's palatial. By the, by 1945, when the bomb was built and dropped, Los Alamos was massive, and you would see these neighborhoods, these rows of just houses, like you know. And I mean, I think in the first year, three thousand kids were born, um, and so the hospital grew. Yeah, it was really wild and. You had you had a community center and you had you know parks and swimming and all of, all of the things. So it, a lot of it was just all of the rec all of the photographs of Los Alamos of, during that time, and we leaned right into the technical section, which was our our huge white buildings. The T section is what it was called, and that's where Oppenheimer gave all of his lectures. That's where the the highest level of things were happening behind that barbed wire. So we in building a town that was a scale we could a build in time and be afford we we tried to encompass all of that on our main street and then our the road going into the just to sell those very poignant moments especially like when the bomb is getting loaded on the back of the truck wrapped in the black plastic and driving off um so yes all of that was um heavily influenced by research by photography photography of that time we had a lot of books extensive books on on 
the making of like just the style most evolving over those four years that they were there was, and that was really helpful. But again, Chris, Chris wanted us to take almost like if you were having a dream, take all of that research, but then build our version of Los Alamos for our film. So it wasn't an exact replica, um, nor were we trying to replicate to the specificity of this building on this street. And here, you know, we, we, our version of Main Street and Trinity Avenue was, was, was specifically, uh, we took creative liberty for our film, if that makes sense. The film is a big achievement for the medium of IMAX. Were there any specific design considerations in the production that catered to Chris's and Hoyt's way of filming internal versus external shots, color versus black and white IMAX film shots, or just to accommodate the expanded aspect ratio? In terms of, in terms of designing for black and white and color, we treated it exactly the same. Um, and we did not manipulate anything in black and white to let's say accentuate maybe the gray shades or variations. We really truly dressed very naturally so that Chris had the option of shooting any of it in color or black and white. He had already made up in his mind how he wanted the black and white and the color to be shot. But for instance, in the scene where they're in the New York um, ballroom, and Strauss storms in, wants to talk to them and confront Oppie about, you know, there's a spy at Los Alamos. We shot that in black and white and we shot that in color, both from Strauss's POV and from Oppenheimer's POV because they obviously differed on their opinions at that meeting. And it was great. So, you, you know, the flowers, the everything was done, the tablecloths, the suits, everything was done so that he had the capability throughout the entire film to shoot either. So we didn't do any unique or special tricks to maybe accentuate our grayscales, if that's what you're curious about. And I think in general, it was very exciting with the IMAX because I, you know, Chris, typically people think of IMAX and they think of just these huge vistas and you think of like Animal Planet or, you know, shows, nature shows, right? But with IMAX, Chris and Hoyta put the face, I mean, it's, it's like right up in the actor's faces. So makeup, hair, every, you know, from, from my standpoint, I was thrilled because you could see that I, when I design and how I build, I do everything in the real. So all my materials, the wood, the roofing, the porches, everything is natural. I'm not using faux products. So to have the camera so vivid and, and to have every, the textures of what it is, it just feels incredibly natural. And so it was important. We were down to, I was making sure my screws, like my slotted screws were period correct. My nails were period correct. You know, a lot of that stuff has changed over time. It, the building, the the ways of building and that, that was key. That was key for the art department. But in general, I embraced it and was thrilled because oftentimes it's all very soft in the background and you can't really see the true detail. But another important thing for Chris and I was, was, was being minimal and keeping being a period film covering five decades. Oftentimes period films can get overdressed was our feeling. And, and so many things screaming it's 1928, it's 1936. And we wanted to not have very, um, distracting objects on the sets and let the vehicles, I mean, for instance, we would get in conversation about a vehicle and if it's 1928, he should probably be driving a 1925 car because it's not like everyone's getting a brand new car during that time every year, like people do now. But Chris really liked a car from the 1930s, but instead of focusing on the grill or anything that would give it away. It's just really the shape that you see in the frame of the car pulling out, but he liked the specific blue. And I think it was, it was pulling ourselves away from overly period objects, telephones, water fountains, things that almost feel quaint when you truly put them in a scene, even though they're a 1925 water fountain, it just your eye almost goes, it becomes distracting, if that makes sense. So we tried to eliminate anything that was, I want to use the word kitsch, but too um, precious, as Chris would say. He didn't want precious. He wanted timeless. He wanted 
to be able to jump around in scenes and in sets and cross over time periods and not have this object stick out. Um, so so the, I guess when ultimately what I'm trying to say is we would dress these sets and then this and my set decorator, Claire Kaufman, and I would really pull back the layers to a place where she and Chris and I were like, yes, this feels good. It's not overly dressed. It's not underly. It's like perfectly appointed. And so it was a, a, a rigorous process the whole way through really manicuring those sets that so that they were um, just properly appointed. Could you tell us more about your hand in creating the practical shots of the abstract visuals of quantum mechanics processes and how the bomb would operate? So the bomb, obviously the bomb is very prominent and it was very prominent throughout the entire script. And we knew we wanted to build the bomb from the ground up entirely, perfectly to scale. This was an area that we wanted to be very exacting. And we had uh, the making of book that a scientist had put together that was I think loosely involved with the project and it's a very rare book and we had a set designer draw up from the core the plutonium core all the way and we, there's the scene um, in the radiation laboratory at Los Alamos when they're placing the lenses it almost looks like a football this the shape of the lenses and um, so we we broke the whole thing down but then had the whole thing complete at the end and Every piece of wiring was exact. That's what it was. That's where it was. That's where it was placed. And I think it was really important to Chris because that in and of itself, like Killian, was such a prominent character throughout the entire film, you know, leading up. Can we do this? Can we achieve this? Can we get there? They're getting there. They're doing these mini tests. And along the way, we're, we're forming this. And Chris is able to see it in all these varying states. And I think it created so much tension and energy throughout because you're thinking, oh, they're doing it, but are they really going to do it? Is it really going to work? And I, I think that scene at the end when Matt Damon is Grove's character is talking to Oppenheimer and he goes, so tell me there's 0% chance that you're going to blow up the world if I, and he's like, not zero, and he, you know, and it was just such a, they still didn't know. I mean, they they knew enough to know that they believed they'd be successful. But I think that moment and tension in the film when you are, well, first I'll back up really quick. When Oppenheimer is standing at the very top of the tower and there's that silhouette of him with his hand on the, you know, standing next to the bomb at its final resting place for the very first test, knowing this is either going to be terrible and go terribly wrong, or this is going to be successful. And that to me was such a poignant shot of, of um, and then cutting to, and then it is successful. And um, I think, so from the get-go, we knew that was going to be a 360 build entirely and be the most hero prop and carry that through with us the entire way. Um, and I think the imagery similar to the, how we wanted to do our sets, it was the same thing in total collaboration with Andrew Jackson and Scott Fisher, special effects, Andrew Jackson, VFX, and um, myself and Hoyta and Chris of bu building these worlds and creating these worlds. And it, 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 this, and filming them and then Chris chose what goes where ultimately in the editing but we had so much content material with all of these different um, techniques we were using that were very naive in a sense it's talk I'm talking about a fish tank with varying liquids with varying gold sand dust and moving it and you know there's that um, scene you can see of kind of this ball spinning with Killian laying in the bed in Europe when he's in at Cambridge in college and it's just it's right there. And I think all of that was nothing more, nothing less. That's exactly what Chris wanted and needed to communicate those things. So it was very, it was, it, we just kept doing these tests, all versions, all types. And then Chris pulled his favorite content essentially. And in the beginning, kind of the, the jumping off point was I had done a huge mood board of like just thinking about all of these scenes and breaking them down and putting imagery to them. And then from the imagery, Scott and Andrew figured out ways to kind of 
practically create that. So I think what was so awesome about Oppenheimer was, you know, every, most everyone thinks VFX, visual effects, it's all, well, you take a computer and you do it in a computer, but our visual effects are visual effects, but we did them practically. And there's such a beauty to the entirety of Oppenheimer being done practically and then captured on celluloid on this film. So it was, um, it was really monumental for all of us to to do that and go there and not waver in our intentions on doing it all um, in the real. So we have Chris to thank for that because he championed that the entire way.